You might ask, what does the Lord of the Rings and Christmas have to do in common with each other? Isn't this one of uh, John's eccentricities? And it may be, but I believe that there is actually an uh, historical connection that Tolkien deliberately encodes into the body of his work. Now, on March the 25th, perhaps one of the greatest events of Middle-earth's history happens. The Ring of Power, the object through which Sauron, the Dark Lord of this mythical universe, works much of his evil, is thrust into the fire of Mordor, destroying uh, evil's effective ability to have complete sway. Now, we want to communicate something very clear, and I think that Tolkien made this clear in his fiction. By the destruction of this object, the Ring of Doom, it isn't as though all evil is forever vanished. Evil will continue to exist, will begin to plague the kingdom that is established by a great king by the name of Aragorn. Yes, it is a period of time that will still face uh, physiological death and corruption and hierarchies and power. However, the enemy is now known to be permanently defeated. Similar to uh, Adolf Hitler in the middle of the Second World War, after our advancements on uh, Normandy and well into German soil, it was very clear that the Nazis would lose the war. But even though they would lose the war, uh, the members of the Third Reich decide to throw everything that they had, everything that they had at the Allies. Not because they were fighting to win, but if they were going to go down, they wanted to take everyone they could down with them. And the demons are like this, and Satan is like this. Uh, theologically speaking, the devil knows that he is lost. He is lost at the cross. He is lost in light of the empty tomb. He is lost in light of the incarnation of God the Son. And yet, he wants to drag as many of God's children down with him. And this is a reality that, as sober Bible-believing Christians, we must keep this in view. At the same time, in Middle-earth terms, yes, the kingdom of Mordor, the actual presence in a physical, tangible, material, uh, dare I say, in, in a, a mockery of the incarnation, in a very um, obvious visual way, the presence of the Dark Tower is thrown down. But of course, you know, the whispers of the enemy will inevitably pass on through the, the frailty of man. And yet all of this occurs... Nevertheless, as a great victory, the armies of darkness are defeated. The ring is thrust into the fire on March the 25th. The one age of the world, an age of sorcery, of power, of might, of the mystical is ended. And the fourth age, the age of the dominion of man, has now finally begun. And the elves travel into the west. Archetypically, a beautiful narrative of a kind of loss of a great cosmic time period of struggle, wrestling with malevolence, and now a new state of maturity has arisen, as evil is once again uh, uniquely chained, but still given some room with on the leash. And this is interesting because Tolkien deliberately chose March the 25th As a good medievalist, he would have known in Anglo-Saxon England, this would have been known as Lady Day. Because there was a pious early church tradition, I believe it could have been as early as the second century, it's certainly quite early, pious tradition, that the Annunciation, the arrival of the angel Gabriel unto the Virgin Mary, occurred on March the 25th. And that it was at that point with the fiat, the yes of Mary, the God through her womb takes on a human nature. The God, the Son, takes on flesh. And because life begins at conception, 
not at birth. It is at the point of the conception of Christ's human nature. When the pre-existent divine logos takes on a body, that ultimately the victory that will later be accomplished at the cross is now inevitable. There's a beautiful, I love this amazing uh, Protestant hymn, What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Where does the blood of Jesus come? It comes through Mary, at least in his human nature. And so Tolkien is pointing that the gift of Christmas, of December the 25th, nine months later, the gift of the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, the the shepherds adoring, the magi worshipping, the gift that was visually unveiled when we can see the face of the eternal Son of Man in the manger, the ability for us to celebrate and approach Bethlehem and sing, O come, let us adore him, O come, let us adore him, is first established when evil is crushed beneath the heels of the church and of Mary at the point of the 25th of March when the word truly becomes flesh and dwells among us. And so this rather remarkable message about life that Tolkien is offering is built upon this medieval cosmological belief that life itself not only is fundamentally sacred, made in the image and likeness of God in the case of man and woman, but that when we are dealing with the humanity of Jesus, it not only redeems mankind or humans, instead it redeems all of creation itself. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, all of creation is groaning into the day of consummation. Tolkien will say in his work, in the prayer that Frodo sings, calling out for the intercession of Bombadil, depicted as a kind of theophany in uh, the Fellowship of the Ring, until the world is mended. Original sin, the sin of Adam, did fracture all of creation and introduced not only sickness, sin, and death into our flesh, but into the whole created order, where beforehand there was harmony, now there is dissidence. Where beforehand there was structure and unity and peace, now there's the advent of cosmic war. And so Christ, in his incarnation, takes on himself the sins of the world, and in doing so, defeats them to the wood of the tree of life. From the wood of the manger to the wood of the cross, Christ establishes his kingdom. And it is a kingdom, as he teaches us, not through strength of arms. Some trust in chariots but, and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God, Psalm 20. It is not a kingdom that is established on might making right. We think of the vast armies throughout history of Alexander and of Caesar Augustus and of how these tried to impose their view of morality on the world by the edge of a sword or for greed. Instead, he who is strongest takes on the fragilest form. He who was in the form of God appears now in the form of a slave. Obedient to death, even death that will come on a cross. He who is without limit, eternal, the Alpha and the Omega, now arrives as an infant shivering in the cold. Tolkien presents a very similar image, at least an archetype. Aragorn the High King is destined to reclaim the throne of of his ancient ancestor, his ancient father, Isildur, who brought sin and death on the world. He will undo it by redeeming and by saving and by rescuing by passing through the paths of the dead, a kind of death and resurrection motif. The sword of Aragorn is sheathed 
but broken and must be reforged. Cosmically, the world must be reforged. But this is done when Aragorn enters into a place of self-sacrifice, willing to march on the gates of hell itself of Mordor, even though he knows it may very well be his final mission. Even so, we see our blessed Lord choosing to enter into time through the cooperation, through the choice of Mary, choosing to lay down what could have been a comfortable life in Nazareth, to enter into the greatest redemptive love story the world has ever known. And Joseph choosing to leave behind what was comfortable for him to enter into the joy of serving Jesus, even if that meant the great journey out of his own homeland, out of his own country, as we see into Egypt. Out of Egypt, I called my firstborn son. And we ask ourselves today, even if we were to truly assume the highest highest level of illumination for these blessed luminaries we read in the Word, knowing that they were confirmed in graces that we do not know. Even so, we ask ourselves today, could we also radically say yes to God in that form? Could we take up the shattered shards of Narsil in our lives and reforge them And the answer is, by our own work, we cannot do it. By our own righteousness, we fail. And that is why, by grace through faith, receiving what that infant did on our behalf, we are given the grace then to stand and to fight. My brothers and sisters, we live at a time more than ever before where we are brought to the precipice of Mount Doom, where we are brought to the precipice of another cold, manger-like night. And we are repeatedly asked, when faced with the culture of death and of disillusionment, whether we will say yes to love of God and yes to love of neighbor, and yes to standing for the truth even when it is hard. But I can guarantee you that by entering into the yes of Mary and the yes of Joseph, into the yes of the apostles who left all to follow him, that we can enter into a joy unlike any this world can offer us. The enemy is defeated, but he still prowls, and he still pricks at the body of Christ. <coughs> Satan knows he is headed for an eternal rendezvous with doom, and that the pit will only grow in its heat in expectation for his absolute punishment. But every day we have an opportunity to confirm that once-for-all payment that was already accomplished for us on the cross. We have an opportunity to live out our life as saved people, as born-again people, in a way that demonstrates to our neighbor, by grace through faith, that we indeed walk as children of the light and not children of darkness. There's a beautiful book by Dr. Peter Kraft called Socrates Meets Jesus, where Socrates visits a Masters of Divinity classroom and hears about Jesus from the Bible and becomes a committed Christian. Although he has plenty of questions for my type as academics. But he ends the the book by asking his classmates, who are very kind, very loving, very compassionate people. Where are all the Christians? 
If you love this Jesus, Socrates ponders to himself, as much as you say. Shouldn't you love like a Cecilia who gave her life for Christ? Shouldn't you love like a Karl Wojtyla, John Paul II, who endured the threat of imprisonment and of torture, who endured the horrors of Nazism and communism to try and lead the Christian world. Never did he ever believe or think for a moment along the way that he would be raised to the rank of Pope or of Pastor Wormbrandt, who was tortured in a communist prison. As a Lutheran minister, he converted his very captors to the Christian faith by loving them to the end. Where are all the Christians? It takes courage to stand up and profess Jesus is Lord. It takes courage in this culture to say, I am a disciple. It takes courage to say in this culture, more than any earthly good, more than my career, more than family, more than anything, it is Christ who is love in my life, who is the highest good, who then illumines my ability to love my career, love my friends, love my family in a greater way, in a transcendent way. Brothers and sisters, we live in a very politically driven time of right versus left. We live in a very politically charged time where we speak of justice and rights. And while these are important discussions, while these are critically important discussions, let us not bow before the state or a favorite potentate. Let us not bow before Caesar alone, but instead let us adore and worship Christ alone. And in doing so, seeing here the transcendent man, the everlasting man, as G.K. Chesterton would put it, God with us, Emmanuel, by placing him then at the center then perhaps we will not become either a Pharisee or a Sadducee. Perhaps then we will not become overzealous or apathetic. Perhaps then we will not become so fractured and divided. But instead, perhaps then, we might see a new birth of freedom, a renewal of the body, an encouragement so that even in our suffering, those outside the walls of the visible church and those outside of knowledge of Christ will look upon us and they will say, there is a love that they possess that we wish to know. Perhaps then the modern unbelieving world might say of us, as they said of the early Christians who they fed to lions, who they tortured and who they put to the test, see how they love one another. The charity of the early church was extraordinary. The forgiveness of the martyrs for those who put them to the test was extraordinary. Are we prepared to be such disciples? And are we prepared to be such voices of mercy in this culture of tears? I believe that there is hope. Because never before have we possessed the material means to spread the gospel so far. And never before have we possessed such a cry of a generation eager to hear the truth. And never before have there been such young voices such as myself and others who have encountered who are eager to share it. The time is come where we can either 
carry our crosses or be crushed under the weight of them. And if we are only vindicated by our battles, if we see them through, then let us see them through by grace. And when it gets too tough, let us lean upon the one who understands better than anyone else. And so I kneel before the manger with you all, before the tabernacle of God Most High, and with the apostles, the martyrs, and the heroes of every Christian age, I cry, Maranatha Yeshua, come Lord Jesus. Not merely in the eschaton, not merely in the coming of the kingdom, though we eagerly expect that, and we should. That's why in the Lord's Prayer we pray, thy kingdom come. But also, let us pray that he comes to the world through us, his disciples. Or are we not the body of Christ? I pray that you have a beautiful Christmas and wonderful uh, epiphany season. And my heart and my joy and my gratitude go out to all of you.